The big question uh, we really all want to know here is when do we start to see uh, traffic, passenger traffic for these airlines get anywhere close to normal? Yeah, I, I, I don't think we're going to see that for three to five years. Um, if you consider normal, you know, two and a half million that were traveling a year ago at this time, um, figure that, you know, 30 percent of that was international and 30 percent of that at least was business. So, you know, when you think about the fact that Americans really aren't welcome places and people aren't traveling here because of, you know, our, our issues with quarantine rules and, and things that are closed still, um, I would say that a million and a half of two and a half million people would, would go into that bucket. And that would mean the best we can do in the short term is a million. And we're, you know, we're at around 700,000 people a day. And, you know, that's stalled out. The rate of growth is slowed, to your point, um, because of the increase in um, cases that we're seeing in the Sun Belt states, as well as the quarantine rules in the Northeast. So are, as it stands, airlines doing enough? In this case, has Delta done enough, particularly when it comes to the cash burn? It looks as though they're still aiming to reduce that to zero, but many questioning whether they'll manage it. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's a really great question because you have an airline, um, you have costs related to an airline that size to be, you know, twice as big as what it really is and where we're going to probably be at the end of the year. So I suspect that, no, they've, they're not doing enough yet. I think you'll see them announce additional aircraft retirements. They've already announced about 100. Um, we think they probably need to announce at least another, you know, 50 or so. And most of that is going to be your international um, and then for furloughs, I mean, we've talked about this, you know, in the past, how painful it is when people get those notices. That's why they're trying really hard to do it through voluntary um, retirement programs and other, you know, leave of absences and other ways of, of getting the payroll down. But, you know, remember, the costs that they're experiencing right now are, are not entirely accurate because the federal government is paying about 80% of the wages um, th that they cover for the second and for the third quarter. The wages will, will resume, you know, for the airlines in the December quarter when the payroll support program dissipates yeah. or goes away unless the government steps up with more money. And frankly, we don't see that happening. We don't, we don't think there's any appetite for that. In that case, Helene, how concerned are you about leverage ratios? I increasingly hear, I believe, American Airlines is one of the more heavily indebted companies. How concerned are you across the airlines about the levels of debt on this balance sheet? Yep, <laughs> that's a great question, and I don't mean to laugh about it because it's really serious, and it's got everybody, you know, up at night. But so think about it this way. Um, Delta has pushed most of their maturities off until 2022. They did talk about having one due April of 2021 that they'll probably wind up refinancing. I mean, right now, they have access to capital. They have $15 billion in liquidity, assuming no increase in revenue from the billion two that they reported this morning on the airline side. Um, they have enough re uh, money and cash to, to make it um, well over a year and a half. So, you know, think about it that way. Um, American, your specific question, they have an, um, they, their next maturity is not due till 2022, March of 2022. They paid down their term loan that they took back in um, March to get, you know, the immediate liquidity, um, the, the credit line. Um, Southwest also pay down their credit line. So I think all the airlines are being very mindful that they need to be sure they maintain access to, to liquidity, A, and B. Um, American was the one that had no co debt covenant yeah. um, issues. Um, they always had a liquidity test. They had to have $2 billion of total liquidity. That includes cash and other um, unencumbered assets. Um, Delta shifted to that. They got all their lenders to agree to no debt covenants. So that's not an issue for them. And United did the same. So your big three should be able to make it to 2021 when we see, you know, some, when we're hopeful that no. by next year, we get some improvement that this virus is, is under control mm -hmm. and it isn't, um, it isn't running rampant, you know, mm -hmm. a year from now, that would be a disaster for 
you know, on a lot of different levels if yeah. it was still the way it is today, a year from now. So, Helene, with regards to, to the cost picture, and when you take a look at uh, fuel prices, I mean, a lot of traders right now who have been speculating uh, on the potential rebound in airlines have been keeping an eye on what jet fuel has been doing. We've seen a spike up, of course, off those uh, monster lows that we had. But I guess the question is, under normal circumstances, when you would see jet fuel prices fall as much as they did, that would generally be a boon for the airlines in terms of cost savings. Is there any sort of hope that the airlines were able to sort of lock in any of that? Or was just the supply out there just so much that is not really going to factor into their cost structure uh, in, in that near or medium term? Yeah, most of the airlines stopped hedging because they did it wrong and they didn't benefit. So we don't see that much um, anymore. I think it's it would be good so this is kind of perverse. It would be good if oil prices were up because demand was up. But of mm. course, there's no demand right now. And the the amount of flying the airlines are doing, you know, just on a worldwide basis, not only in the U.S., is so much lower than it was a year ago that there's just no demand for jet fuel right now. Um, and that's kept costs low, which has been a big benefit, right? I mean, we estimate that when you think about lower fuel costs and the fact that the federal government is paying wages, the break-even load factor for some of these airlines is probably somewhere around 25 or 30%. It's after October 1st when the airlines have to pay for their labor again that the break-even load factor jumps up significantly because they're once again, you know, admin paying their own payroll as opposed to, you know, administering what is basically an employment program mm. um, that the airlines are covering that's paid for by the government. 